So, good evening everyone, and I am Ada Fama, a PhD candidate in transnational constitutional law here at King's College and a research fellow at the Transnational Law Institute. So, a warm welcome to all of you. Um, we have the great honor to um, be joined by Professor Joseph Weiler today. And I've just been wisely advised not to go on into a long presentation about his long, inspiring, impressive career. Um, and he might be right, it might take too long. And besides, there is Google, right? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, so what I want to point out is his current position as a professor of law at um, New York University and um, his a previous position as president of the European University Institute in Florence. And um, today he is going to speak about um, the European crisis but um, giving us some deeper insights um, than those we are probably most used to, um, the ones regarding globalization and lack of democracy and whatever. So um, thank you very much once again, Professor Weiler, for joining us. And well, um, before um, the talk starts, um, the Transnational Law Institute Director, um, Per Zumbansen, Professor Per Zumbansen, will, will give some few more words of introduction and at the end of the talk um, there will be some time for questions should you wish to take the opportunity. Thank you. Good. I'll be very brief too. Thank you very much. So from Ada Farmer, my colleague at the TLI, you just heard a little bit about our guest today and I just want to put two or three small things on the table to give a little more background to our guest. I very brief, yes, yes. I always promise to be brief. I always do. And then I'm sometimes not. Professor Weiler comes to us today and only for tonight's lecture from New York City. So just a few quick words to express my and our gratitude for joining us at the Institute today and to deliver the last lecture in this academic term in the post-Brexit lecture series at the Institute on Contesting Globalization. I shall try to analyze the community constitutional order with particular regard to its living political matrix, the interactions between norms and norm-making, constitution and institutions, principles and practice, the court of justice and the political organs will lie at the core of this article. Thus wrote Professor Weiler in his famous and highly influential Yale Law Journal article with the title The Transformation of Europe. The article reflected on the seismic changes of the European integration process through an analysis of the community's revolution and evolution during the time before the crucial date of 1992, which would mark the signing of the Maastricht Treaty, which included the decision for the euro and the three pillar structure of the EU, right through its early years of coming into being. Professor Weiler's analysis hit a nerve in the already at the time fast evolving scholarship by lawyers and political scientists on European law and European integration because he required us to think about the tensions between the community's breathtaking developments and the underlying visions through which different stakeholders could be depicted to be imagining but also justifying the very process of European integration. Referring to the, quote, transnational European context, Professor Weiler juxtaposed what he called the unity and the community visions at the heart of the European project and prompted us to explore the deeper tensions and relations between them. In this same article, he wrote that both in its structure and process and in part its ethos, the community has been more than a simple successful venture in transnational cooperation and economic integration. It has been a unique model for reshaping transnational discourse among states, peoples, and individuals who barely a generation ago emerged from the nadir of Western civilization. It is a model with acute relevance for other regions of the world with bleak histories or an even bleaker present." End of quote. Today, Professor Weiler will speak about the spiritual crisis of Europe, 
This work builds on years of groundbreaking analysis, research and teaching of European law, trade and constitutional law, which have made him one of the most revered thinkers on the European project today. It is through him that I and many others in Europe, North America and around the world have been pushed to think about the real meaning of referring to a European project and to reflect more deeply about the foundations, the ingredients, but also the stakes of that very project. What, in other words, do lawyers really have to say today in light of the current transformation of Europe? Can we limit ourselves to an analysis of Article 50, its execution and timeline, or what must we not look beyond the law in an attempt to reconnect the deeper promise of a legal order with the still prescient struggle for a peaceful, socio-economically just and sustainable community? Professor Weiler continues to prompt us to see Europe as a conundrum, but as a fragile one. This conundrum, in my view, resituates the European project in the larger context of human fate. The lawyer's perspective is, unfortunately too often, merely idiosyncratic, in that it is so often either wholly besides the point of what the real issues are which would require our attention, or so full of hubris in that lawyers tend to ponder on abstract models rather than delving into the inquit and sticky matter of experience. From a different perspective, we learn to recognize the European project as a miracle, which requires our care and commitment. And Professor Weiler continues to teach us how we ought not to take EU law as a given, as a field of rules and principles, but as an invitation to reflect on our very ability to generate law as refuge and as an instrument of collective emancipation in the face of ignorance and overwhelming noise. We are very grateful to him for joining us here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you all for inviting me. One is always so ambiguous about these introductions, so I can't resist a lovely little Jewish joke. So this guy is lying dead in his grave and the rabbi is giving a, a, the eulogy. He was generous and he was wise and he was kind and a wonderful husband, blah, blah, blah. And then the cadaver raises and says, don't forget to tell them how modest I was. <laughs> kind of capture these moments. Uh, this is how I want to approach this, uh, this talk tonight. I first want to talk of about Europe not in the European Union sense and the meta-state of democracy. In other words, not in an institutional sense, but uh, in a deeper sense, as you will see. And then I will say something about how I understand the current circumstance of Europe without reference to the Euro. And only then I will say something about Brexit and what I think are the options and why I think the way Brexit is approached now is wrong and why, how I think it should be approached in a different way. So that's more or less the scheme. Forgive me, I'm a lifelong conscientious objector to Facebook, Twitter, but also to PowerPoint. So you have to keep it all, all the balls in the air in your mind without the aid of a visual thing. Now, so starting with Europe in a non-community sense is difficult. And I'm going to make three connected points. But the first point, I think, applies with considerable force to continental Europe and far, far less to the United Kingdom. The second two points, I think, would also apply to the United Kingdom. So <clears throat> I see three long-term processes which begin more or less at the end of the Second World War and also, the Second World War explains these processes. It's, the, it's what generates them, in a way. And the first process, the, the, the best way I can think of uh, explicating it is to say that in our political vocabulary, and as a result also in our political culture, we banish the word patriotism. Nobody t uses that word. It carries with it especially in continental Europe, all the abuses of that word during uh, National Socialism and Fascism in Italy and Fascism in France, etc. It's just not bon ton to either even refer to that word, nobody would say I'm a patriot, or to exhort people to be patriots. Uh, we only f 
wave the flag at a football match. And the whole uh, sensibility that goes with the concept, it's almost forgotten in our political culture. And for understandable reasons, and in some part for good reasons, because it's such a, as history has shown us, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a sensibility which can lead to so much abuse uh, and evil. But with the loss of patriotism in our political vocabulary and our political culture, there are also deep losses which, uh, in my view, are important to notice and which explain part of the current circumstances. Because patriotism in its bright side, in its positive side, is a discipline of love. It's a discipline of love to one's people. It's a discipline of love to one's nation. <coughs> uh, it's a discipline of responsibility towards others, uh, a kind of commitment. Uh, it's from within that vocabulary, uh, that one understands the concept of demos. Now, demos is, is, too is the word which we shy away a little bit from. But here, yeah, my views are very firm. I, I strongly believe that demos <coughs> is a foundational, essential uh, foundation for a functioning, healthy democracy. So it's not a lexical thing, democracy. It's an ontological thing. No demos, no democracy. Now, of course, our understanding of demos has changed with years. We don't believe in an ethnic demos, or we don't believe in an organic demos. But we need demos for the following simple reason, that I, I, I give you a political theory of democracy. There's a little black hole or a big black hole in the middle. It's very difficult to explain the basic or primordial, or primordial norm of democracy that the majority has the right to coerce the minority. It's, we take it axiomatically because it's really very difficult for political theory to explain it. It's, it, it's a given. And I've checked from Locke onwards. Uh, the, the majority might be evil, the majority might be mean, the majority might be wrong, the majority might be stupid, but in democracy we give the majority the power, the ability, the legitimacy to coerce the minority. I don't have a real answer to that. So I too just say it's axiomatic. That's what we mean when we say democracy, or it's a central part of what we mean when we say democracy. And it's essential for democracy that we internalize this norm that in democracy, subject to protection of fundamental and minority rights, the majority gets to, has the power to coerce the minority. But here I will make both, this is an empirical observation, that it only works when there is a demos. In other words, that acceptance of that basic rule of democracy, there has to be a strong sense of demos no matter how it's defined, and demos can be defined in different ways. If you don't feel part of the demos, then you rebel against this notion, why should they be telling me what I have to do, etc. If you make a mental example, imagine an Anschluss between Denmark and Germany. Germany is a real model democracy. And you tell the Danes you will be full citizens, you can vote to the Bundestag, and you can be elected, you can be a chancellor, you will enjoy all the protections of the German constitution and the Bundesverfassungsgericht, and the Danes are going to say thank you, but no thank you. And they will say because it's not our demos, it, we, it's Germans who will be ruling Danes. So I just try to illustrate why demos is so important to the thriving and the good health of a democracy, because if that sense of demos disappears, then you have in some sense of profound alienation and contestation of the normativity, the essential normativity of democracy. It's a kind of peaceable way. But patriotism is not only important because it's patriotism that gives substance to the sense of demos, however we define demos. Patriotism is important for a republican form of democracy. 
and my contention here, and in a lecture like this, I think I'm permitted to be a little bit polemical and exaggerated, you know, a bit like the economists, simplify and exaggerate it, they have on their mask. Uh, uh, we call it the Italian Republic or the French Republic or the Federal Republic of Germany, as it's still called the Federal Republic. None of these are real Republican democracies, just by name. Uh, the Republican democracy, is, first of all, is the opposite of fascism. It's not the individual belongs to the state, but the state belongs to the individual. But it presupposes that it's not just by slogan, but by actually the practice and habits of, of political life and social life. The citizens are the ones who give direction to the polity. That's the deep essence of the Res Publica. And patriotism is part and parcel of that. Because you love, because you feel involved, because you care, it's a communitarian instinct, and you take charge, and you don't do it just out of duty. You do it because of a deep sense of this is what it means to be a citizen in a republic. And it's mine, and what happens in it is of concern to me. When you, you lose that sense, you turn into what is increasingly, I think, the circumstances in many European states, which is a more mercantile form of democracy, which was theorized by Schumpeter. When I say mercantile, I don't mean it in a Marxist sense, capital rules, etc. I mean that we expect services from our government in the way we expect services from Verizon or T-Mobile or something we pay taxes, they should do their thing, and if we don't like the service, we change our cell phone provider, we change the government at the, the next election. But we don't feel ourselves responsible. I, I was not outraged, but I was almost contemptuous when I saw the demonstrations of the Greeks in front of the Greek parliament throwing firebombs, etc., not because of the violence, because of you are responsible, as if the people were not responsible for electing that government, for being happy with it when 14 salaries were paid and people were not paying taxes, etc. It's the us, them. It's not, it's the same anger that you have with a corporation or with an airline that I paid for my ticket and you didn't give me the services I expect, which I find a very, very reduced and impoverished form of democracy. And it's certainly not the Republican model of democracy. And I think the disappearance of the discipline, the vocabulary, the political culture of patriotism is one part of that transformation of our political life, which is quite rife. So the second long-term process, starting at the end of the Second World War and the Second World War being in some way responsible and maturing over the years, is our enthrallment with rights, and I mean not only fundamental human rights, but a general culture of rights. So there was that glorious moment. Now make no mistake. Uh, I don't want anybody to leave this room and say, Wyler said that he doesn't think fundamental human rights and robust protection of fundamental human rights is not important. I would not want to live in a society that does not respect and effectively protect against violation of fundamental human rights. But like with uh, patriotism, I want to also show the darker side of that culture of rights. <coughs> but the first thing is just descriptive, because it's not just that very rapidly, you know, and if you reread Capaletti's book from the 70s, it, uh, end of the Second World War, you could count the number of countries which had judicial review and protection of fundamental human rights on the, in the world on the fingers of two hands. And now you could count on the fingers of two hands the states that do not have it. It was a very rapid uh, constitutional uh, evolution. And I think this, the, the experience of the Second World War explains it a bit. There was this just rebellion against the kind of power that one gave, even in democracies, to the executive branch and the legislative branch, and the understanding that there had to be some control. But I think the culture of rights goes beyond protection of fundamental rights. It's in our legal culture, 
we managed to transform almost any legal discourse into a discourse of rights. So industrial relations, it's not about relations, it's about rights of workers or rights of employers, etc. Even in family law, if you, you can track it just by looking at textbooks, or in the United States it would be case books, uh, over the last 50 years, and you see how rights discourse begins to dominate family law the right of the spouse, the rights of children, etc. It's not the content that changes. The material and substantive content moves much more slowly. It's the way we frame the issue. We tend to frame it as issues of rights. In consumer law, in contract law, across the board, discourse, rights discourse uh, is, I don't want to say is, has monopolized or colonized everything but is very, very ubiquitous. We Legally, we, the, the first thing we think of, we turn to rights. Is there a right there, et cetera? So it's, it's not just about constitutional or international protection of rights. I think the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice, and I observe this, there's no normativity in this statement, is a strong jurisprudence of rights. It started with community rights and then fundamental human rights, and now citizenship rights, layer of layers of rights. And the, the way it's formulated sometimes, and I think it's a good description, is we put the individual in the center. So when you take the culture of rights and you try to conceptualize it in political and social terms or in political theory terms, you say it's a culture which puts this individual in the center because the rights typically attach to the individual. The dark side of it is that you put the individual in the center, but slowly, not intentionally, and that's why it takes decades until it, you turn that individual into a self-centered individual. And self-centered individual are not the good, the good sociality for good functioning democracy, because the instinct is anything that happens, we, even outside a legal context, not in a courtroom, it's my rights that are being violated. Let's just go a little bit deeper. Uh, a culture of rights is a culture of entitlement. That's what rights mean. It's a culture of entitlement, positive and negative entitlement. The rights that I have in terms of deserts and the rights that I have in terms of protections. I'm entitled not to be treated in this way. I'm entitled to receive these kinds of deserts. And in the political process, it's not fully maturated, but we are very much advanced in this process. When we don't like something the executive branch does administratively, and that's the real action, administrative law, not constitutional, or what the legislature does, our instinct is to go to court, to frame it as a violation of a right, and. The more we expand the notion of equality, the more pregnant, fecund, it is to be able to translate these issues, these outcomes of the political process into rights. And we go to court, and two, the two, the two downsides to that instinct. The one is that a, we don't feel responsible for what happened. It's they did it, so I'm going to take them to court. B, our political action is to protect rights, and we go to court to protect rights. It's not let's mobilize in order to change the outcome of the administrative, the governance process. It's, so I think that's negative, and that connects to my first point about the demise of the Republican tradition of democracy. But the other thing, which is equally bad, once the court says it's kosher, we accept that. So we have rights culture becomes the ultimate arbiter of our normativity. And in the context of constitutional law in our, in our states which have robust constitutional systems and definitely in the culture of the European Union with the European Court of Justice, when the European Court of Justice gives a decision which is based on the treaty, not on a piece of legislation, 
when a constitutional court in Italy or in Spain or in Germany or in other countries gives a rights protection based on the constitution, they remove it from politics because then it's constitutional. Or at least they elevate it to the level of constitutional politics. You need to change the constitution, which in some countries it's easier. In Germany, they change the constitution on average once a year. In other countries, it's much more difficult. In the European Union, it's almost impossible. We need an intergovernmental conference, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, think of our emotional reactions to important decisions of the European Court of Justice defending rights. Our instinct is to celebrate them. But what I'm teaching you is that there's also a loss. You've taken something out of politics. It's now outside the contestation of politics. And politics and contestation and political argument and political fights, even passion, that's the life of democracy. So a resolution which is constitutionalized, etc., it has that effect of our democracy. We get an in this mercantile thing, they decide. So our political action is let's just change the government, the Schumpeterian model. And our contestation is let's challenge to see because our rights have been violated. And if we win, we're happy and we don't see that there's a loss because we've taken an issue that can be and should be contested politically and people can think about differently and change their mind over time. It's out of politics. We almost celebrate in the culture of rights taking things out of politics. What is so obvious and so not noted is that in the discourse of rights, there's no discourse of duties. It's emblematic in the citizenship clause of the European Union. Nationals of the member states are hereby citizens of the European Union, subjects to all the rights and duties enumerated herein. And that's the last time in the entire treaty that the word duty appears. And no duties are not enumerated. A citizenship without duty is a very bizarre kind of citizenship. And it's true that you can say if there's a right, there's typically a corresponding duty. But interestingly, the corresponding duty in eight out of 10 cases is of the public body, not of the individual. So the individual has rights, and the public body, the public authority, has the corresponding duty. But as I say, that's an impoverished sense of citizenship, where citizenship carries no duties, and above all, no responsibility. That's the death of democracy. When the individual feels alienated from him or her government, it's your fault, what did you do? And doesn't say, what do you mean, what did you do? It's what I did. I voted for them. Now, I'm not saying that we're not justified in the current circumstances of politics to feel alienated in that way. I'm just lamenting, I want to show that it's a certain corruption that has taken four or five or six de decades to mature where we've reached that point. The third long-term process, fasten your seatbelts, is secularization. Now, I'm not going to give you an evangelical, this is not an, a call to evangelize, uh, go back to Jesus. Uh, absolutely not. I don't judge people by their faith or lack of faith. I know zillions of truly believing people who are horrible and commit dreadful acts. And, and my very own brother, who is a confirmed atheist, is a noble person. He is as ethical. So I also don't philosophically buy the often hubris claim of religion that ultimately morality depends on faith or religion. No. So why am I saying that secularization is a long-term process which has had very deep consequences on our political culture? Uh, so first of all, it's an empirical fact. Uh, in the United Kingdom, on a weekend, there are more Muslims in a mosque than there are Christians in church. The churches are empty, and that is true for most of Western Europe. It's true with, for a lot of Eastern Europe, with the exception of Poland and some islands elsewhere in Eastern Europe. Basically, our churches are empty, so that's what I call secularization. So who cares, right? If you say you don't judge people by their faith, this is the sense in which I think it has had a profound impact on our polity. Because 
in the pre-secularization, whether you were religious or not, whether you went to, to church or not, there was a ubiquitous and loud voice in our public space, the voice of the church, the voice of religious community, which spoke entirely with the idiom of responsibility and duty. You never hear a sermon by a priest saying, this is your rights, fight for it. It's always, this is your responsibility and duty towards your neighbor. This is the responsibility and duty towards God. The German constitution begins with the word, aware of our responsibility towards God and men, and then the responsibility also disappears there. But it's a language, it's an idiom, it's a public message. And it doesn't matter if you believe it or not, it was part of the political culture that there was a loud, ubiquitous voice which spoke about responsibility of duty so that those words were part of whether you were Christian or not, religious or not, faithful or not. It was not alien to the ears that there is a discipline called responsibility and duty, and not just of the state, but of the individual. Because, of course, that's the great political revolution of part of the great political revolution of Christianity, when St. Paul says there's no longer Jew or Gentile, freedman, bonded or freedman, man and woman, all are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a personalized religion. So when the church speaks about responsibility and duty, it's not them, it's you. And that has disappeared from our public discourse, and that's why I say that the secularization of Europe has consequences for our political culture. So this is the end of the first part of my presentation. These three long-term processes, which the result of which are we put the individual in the center, but we push him or her towards an uh, existence of self-centered individuals, we weaken the bonds of the demos. We eliminate from our vocabulary, our political culture, our sensibility, the notion of individual duty and responsibility in a political and social sense. We have to pay taxes and not break the law. That's more or less our citizenship uh, uh, existence. And in that way, we have undermined a notion of Republican democracy, which we aspire to, because look how many states call themselves Republican. And even the ones that call themselves kingdom, they aspire to a Republican form of democracy. It's gone, it's not there. So now I want to turn to the European Union. Because it's a little bit like a perfect storm. We have this long-term emerging process and now we have the crisis of the European Union. The crisis of the European Union is not the Euro. The Euro crisis is a, a lens through which to understand the deeper crisis of the European Union. So here I'll bore you, because I will use that underspecified word. In my class, I don't allow my students to use it, but here I will not practice what I preach, which is legitimacy. And I want to show you uh, the, very briefly the three sources of legitimacy of the European Union, all of which have collapsed in the last five, ten years. And why it's so significant, it's because when do you need legitimacy, other than in the classroom or for writing some learned article? Governments need legitimacy when they have to take or unpopular measures. Measures which go against the trend. That's when they use the resources of legitimacy, because it's not the resources of popularity, it's the resources, you don't like what I'm doing, but you don't challenge my legitimacy to do it. And when you have weak legitimacy, you can't take those kinds of measures. And when we get to Brexit, I will show you where that kind of thing comes to roost. So why do I speak? What are the three sources of legitimacy? So there's input and output. Input is process legitimacy. Output is result legitimacy. Let's, say, let's start with output. It's the easiest. In my view, in the last 30, 40 years, <clears throat> it's been the most important resource of European Union legitimacy, the incredibly successful output of the process of European integration in terms that matter to people, prosperity. It's not that they remember the Second World War, but the peaceful existence. 
Schumann was much more successful than he even imagined because when he wrote in the Schumann Declaration to make war not only materially impossible, which of course was a nonsense, it was materially possible within five years of the Declaration, but make it unthinkable, it really is unthinkable. It's impossible for us to imagine the reality of war. That's why we call the Ukraine the Ukraine crisis instead of the Ukraine war. And we don't take security so seriously because it's just something that doesn't happen. How could sensible people go to war? Uh, but I'm not just talking, so it's a kind of peaceful existence, huge prosperity, a good life to which the European Union in some way we should give credit and responsibility. The, the life of just about everybody in the European Union improved, not equally. The European Union didn't solve our inequality problem, but it certainly raised across the board the prosperity fall. So it's legitimately de derived from these results. The Commission would speak about it openly. They would say, we legitimate ourselves by delivering the results. It's a little bit like bread and circus. If you want to kind of see the dark side of output legitimacy, but the most important difficulty with outport legitimacy is its precariousness, because when you don't deliver the results, when you have a crisis of output, then it's over. Because if you legitimate yourself only, so the best way to legitimate a war is to win it, but if you lose the war, you have no legitimacy whatsoever. So with the crisis of 2008 and a different kind of security threat emerging of a double sense, both the re coming back of, if, if not the Cold War, the Cool War, and the threat of terror, etc. Suddenly, those kind of deserts which the European Union so successfully developed, desert, uh, delivered, material and, and peace in a profound sense, you know, forget about Germany and France, they're not there. So suddenly, that basic form of legitimation is gone overnight. The second is process legitimacy. So now, process legitimacy, the other word to call it is democracy. As long as we, when we accept that decisions, even tough, tough decisions are taken in a democratic way, then we live with them. It's primordial. And I know that to this audience I don't need to do it, so I'll do it in 180 seconds, which explain why Lisbon Treaty, notwithstanding the European Union, continues to suffer, not from a la margin, but from a truly profound problem of democracy. And the reason for that is a design flaw, not a pernicious flaw, not a conspiracy, a fundamental design flaw which some people haven't even understood it to this day, but it was very clearly understood in the 60s and 70s that a weak parliament meant that you have empowered the executive branch of the member states in the council and that there's a democratic deficit. And therefore, the solution seemed so obviously we have to increase the powers of the European parliament, especially when we moved thankfully, to majority voting in the council on so many area, in so many areas. So the veto as a democratic instrument disappears when you move to majority voting. And in the last 10, 15 years, there's actually been a lot of majority voting. It's not just there. They take votes. So empowering the European Parliament was the solution to the democratic deficit. And since Certainly with the Treaty of Lisbon, we've reached a situation, look, no democracy is perfect. But it's not fanciful to say that the parliament is a veritable co-legislature with the council. So most people say the democracy deficit has been solved. The democracy challenge has been solved, and we wish Wilo would shut up. It hasn't. And I want to explain to you why, because from the beginning, the notion that just giving powers to the European Parliament is going to be the solution. So I'll go to the two most primitive notions of democracy. It's not what defines democracy, but it's like a hallmark on your gold ring. If you don't have it, it's not gold. It doesn't define what gold is, but if there's no gold mark, there's no gold. And it's something that 
cuts across all forms of democracy, the French model, the German model, the Italian model, the British model, etc. One, to give it a fancy word, is the principle of accountability. But I think the Brits have a much nicer expression than the principle of accountability, which is the ability to throw the scoundrels out. You don't like who governs you, and you don't like the way they govern you, you can throw them out and replace them. It's very primitive. It's very primitive, but it's hard to think of democracy if you can't throw the scoundrels out. That's why a one-party state is not a democracy, even if it's free elections. That's why in states where the same party wins again and again and again and again, you begin to, to worry about their democratic credentials. And the second thing, equally primitive, equally primordial, is if enough people vote in a certain way, that voter preference has to be translated into the policies of the, of the polity. For the purest, it's never enough, but it does make a difference if it's a center-right or center-left government or coalition. It does make a difference if it's Sarkozy or Hollande. So Hollande triangulates, etc., but it's still not the same thing. It does make a difference if it's Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. God help us. So, in the European Union, voter preferences in elections to the European Parliament don't get translated into policy. There's not a single study that can show that other than anecdotally. You can't show that if there's a center-left majority in the European Parliament as there is today, the policies of the European Union are center-left. On the contrary, the European Union espouses austerity. And the, 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 the sign of this is this horrible habit in Parliament of every two and a half years changing who will be the president, etc. It's a kind of visible example that voter preference doesn't count. So you, you call that the principle of re representation. You take away the principle of representation and the principle of accountability. You don't get to decide in the European Union, which is a system of governance without government, who's going to govern you. And you don't get to, through your voting and your voter preference, to decide at least the broad direction of how you will be governed. I'm afraid this is a profound challenge to democracy. There's no choice. Choice is at the, fo at, at the root. We should talk about a political deficit rather than a democratic deficit. The, the heart of democracy is political choice. It's either him or her, either this policy or that policy. We don't live that in the reality of governance of the European Union. And the proof of the pudding is in the voting. You, you're all familiar with these two contrasting graphs. From 1979 onwards, more and more powers to the European Parliament. From 1979 onwards, less and less people vote in elections to the European Parliament. The 2014 elections was the lowest turnout in the 30s. And it would be even lower if we excluded the two countries where voting is obligatory. And it would be even lower if there was not a Eurosceptic move, which was very mobilized. If there wasn't, if the sort of UKIP type thing wasn't very powerful, there would be even less people voting for the European Parliament. But, and, and I'm not Brecht. Well, you remember his quip, the people have disappointed, let's change the people. I, I think the people are wise. Why indeed go and vote for the European Parliament if it doesn't make a difference to who will govern you and how you will be governed? <coughs> It's true that we have problems of democracy in our member states, and we have a decline in turnout, etc. but there's still a very notable difference in the turnout rates in national elections than in European elections. Now, you take these long-term processes, which I described in the first part of my lecture. No, I'm sorry. I forgot the third element of legitimacy. Very, very powerful, and in Europe, it's what I borrowed it from Mark Ma uh, Mazaro, political messianism. You get legitimacy not by the results you achieve, not by 
the process you achieve that results, but by the telos, the objective to which you work. Political messianism informed empires, etc. And this had a very strong mobilizing force in Europe. Because if you look at the Schumann Declaration, and you look at the Treaty of Paris, and even at the Treaty of Rome, in the Schumann Declaration, the word democracy is not mentioned. The word human rights is not mentioned. What is mentioned is this promised land that this process will bring. And that's what mobilized the elites in Europe. It was very much an elite thing. Political messianism has a very powerful mobilizing force. Because people are willing to make sacrifices, people are willing to put up with a lot if they believe that it's running towards a certain promised land in which they believe. And for a long time, Europe had a narrative which was a narrative of a promised land, and it was a political messianic uh, enterprise. And it became a victim of its success because there are two things that, again, it's been tracked by social scientists where political messianic legitimacy always implodes. It implodes because the reality is messy, never lives up. You know, paradise is paradise only when it's lost. It never lives up to its promise. I, the way to think about it is the 800 words of the Schumann Declaration and the 253,000 words of the Lisbon Treaty. The detail kills the vision, the reality kills the dream, uh, etc. And secondly, it gets killed by success. When it succeeds, it becomes from orthodoxy doxy. It's what we accept and it ceases to mobilize because it's, we mobilize with the promised land when we're living out in the desert. But when we actually enter the promised land, the vision of the promised land, the message of the promised land ceases to mobilize. Then we complain why it's not as promised as it used to be. We, it, it flips. So that also collapsed. So these three sources of legitimacy of the European Union in a perfect storm collapsed together. You take these two long-term trends in Europe and the circumstances of legitimacy in the European Union, and I think you get a good picture of our current circumstance, a picture into which populist uh, parties can fall in, etc. Now, I want to say something about it. About, of course, I would have, if I had the vote, my five children had the vote, but I would have voted to remain. But I don't have contempt to, towards those who voted for Brexit. I'm, I refuse to accept the Marx, Marxist trope of false consciousness. They just didn't understand. If only they had understood better, they wouldn't have voted. I just refuse to accept that. It's, we shouldn't employ that in politics. It's always somebody else that didn't understand. Maybe we didn't understand, you know, the Remainers. And uh, I would be shocked and dismayed if, for example, the Austrians choose this Nazi guy as their president next week. And I will be alarmed if Marine Le Pen uh, wins the presidency in France. But from the things I've said, I'm not saying it justifies that because that's a moral judgment, but I can see easily the process that produces that because some of these populist movements exactly go into the terrain that has been abandoned. If you look at the political platforms of Wilders, of Marine Le Pen, etc., they do use, they use and abuse, but since nobody else uses, that's the only game in town. The vocabulary of love of country, of patriotism, of responsibility. It's a very national social platform for all of them. With some dark memories in our mind. It's always a national social. It's not an elitist. So it's easy for me to understand how this process arises and why it's so mobilizing. It's just wrong to think that it's all about globalization and inequality of incomes and the haves and haves not. It's surely a part, but there's a yearning there. There's an appeal there that is not just, I'm not earning enough and the income, the genie factor has grown. I'm not saying that it's, that is 
what we've been, that's also the way we fail to understand Islam and we fail to understand religious societies because we always comfortably translate everything into material terms and don't take them on their own terms and we're making the same mistake with these populist movements. So Brexit happened. I was invited the day before Brexit on the Wednesday to give a workshop to all the directors of services of the European Parliament. And I don't want to say I predicted Brexit. I said, I don't know, it's a possibility. But I said, I want to describe to you what I think is a huge harm that Brexit has already caused the European Union, even if they vote to remain. It was the discourse of Brexit, Brexit which I found very harmful. And I want to explain it now because, and I will finish in two minutes, because it goes to what I think is not enough at the center of our debate. It was common to British attitude to the European Union, but not common much beyond Britain. Not absent, but not quite as common. That the case for Europe was made in utilitarian terms. We're better off in than out. And who will convince the other side whether by either scare tactics or promises of 500 more million pounds on health, etc. But it was a utilitarian calculus. Are we better off in or are we better off out? And that discourse has now spread throughout Europe. What, it, what has it replaced? And I, I, I find that as damaging as the actual Brexit, damaging as Brexit is, both to the United Kingdom and to, to Europe. Because, again, in a long-term process, something happened which really transformed Europe in a way that I did not see and understand and describe in my article on the transformation of Europe. It was a transformation of the vision of Schumann. Schumann was a utilitarian. He said concrete achievements you have to give. And that he couldn't even say will bring to solidarity, he only brought himself to say will bring to de facto solidarity. But it was a utilitarian vision. If you show people that it's worth it, that it works, that they have concrete achievements, then they will buy into this notion of European integration. My view is that slowly, 70s, 80s, enlargement, etc., two interesting processes happened which have now, I don't want to say been reversed, but they're on a cusp. The most important is that the European Union came to be understood, felt, and it's important to say understood and felt because it's almost subconscious, as a community of fate. What do I mean by a community of fate? A term that the German Latvian philosopher Herde coined, which was out of fashion, but luckily Isaiah Berlin redeemed it. Look, if you have a crisis in Italy, and there's the country split between laic and religion, between austerity and growth, between Berlusconi and etc. It's a very contested political environment. Nobody says, well, let's give up on Italy. No. We Italians, we have to fight this out, duke it out among ourselves and find an Italian solution. And when somebody comes and talks about Padania, it's the rejection of the Lega Nord, which is the proof of the pudding. That's breaking, that's not who we are. We are a community of faith. And that is true. That's why I found the Scottish independence so troubling to me, because it's breaking that notion that we're in this together with all our differences, with a new definition of demos. We can have a multinational demos. But it's, we do this together, we can fight right and wing and Catholics and Protestants, whatever con contestation you want, but it's for us to do this together. And Europe began to feel like that. In other words, it did not depend any longer on concrete achievements leading to de facto solidarity. It did not even depend on solidarity. 
can't stand those Germans or those French or those Spanish. But they're part of the family. It's just like a brother that you don't particularly like. But what can you do? He's part of the family. It's an essential transformation. Because it's not just a state of mind, it's also an objective reality. What you do in Italy has an implication in France. What you do in France has an implication on Germany. So you might as well do it together rather than do it against each other, do it separately. The utilitarian discourse of Brexit, what's in it for me, ruptures this notion of community of faith, of fate. It makes the European Union always contingent because at the moment that the bottom line, that the balance, the trade-offs are negative, okay, then let's leave. It does not instill loyalty. It does not instill responsibility. It's a community of states which the member state is in, is in the center and the integration process is contingent. So I am really upset and a little bit surprised, and I think it's not profound the way we are, the Europe is dealing with Brexit. I can understand the initial rage, because when Juncker said in his State of the Union in 2015, one of our four priorities is to bend over backwards to accommodate Britain so that they remain in the Union. I think he was good to his word. And even the accommodation on benefits to, to workers, I wouldn't want to be a judge on the European Court of Justice when that came to be judged, because in my view it went beyond what we teach in our classrooms is the discipline of free movement of workers. It, but they did it. As a sign, I'm just saying that they really were bending over backwards to accommodate Cameron with his irresponsible act of starting this whole process. So then when the Brexit vote came, there was deep disappointment and chagrin, and also alarm because it's a huge blow at so many levels to the European Union. But what I see now is a kind of vindictiveness which it's rationalized instrumentally and strategically in the following way. Instrumentally, it says free movement of workers is, first of all, you know, they forgot about European citizenship. It's about, it's the single market, is an essential component of the single market. And if you don't have free movement of workers, you can't expect to be part of the single market. And the second thing, it's said openly, and not only by the Prime Minister of Slovakia, it is said by Draghi, it is said by Hollande, it is said by Juncker. We have to give them a tough break because otherwise other countries will want, if we make it too soft for them, if we make it a cushy Brexit, it will be too tempting for other member states who will be saying, okay, we want a similar deal. It's totally wrong. It's totally wrong. Both the first leg of that reasoning and the second leg of that reasoning. First leg of the reasoning. Think of CETA. CETA gives extensive access to Canada to the single market. It doesn't give free movement. It doesn't want to give free movement. It gives extensive access, both in goods and in services. But it's not only that it doesn't give free movement. They, it's the last thing in the world that they would want to do is to give free movement. It's not a perfect single market, but it's extensive access to the single market without free movement. The European Union has 150 agreements with countries around the world which give, to different degrees, access to the single market and deliberately do not give free movement. With Turkey, that bastion of democracy, the union is with a customs union, without free movement without free movement. So the notion that you have to have free movement in order to have access to the single market, where does this come from? As lawyers, we just know, as people who do international trade law, we just know, where does this come from? 
What you lose when you're not part of the single market, you don't get to write the rules of the single market. That's the price Britain pays. But from a self-interested utilitarian trade-off, the more access that you give any trading partner to your, to your market, you are better off and they are better off. Since the European Union is much bigger economically than Britain, Britain will suffer because they will have to live with the rules of the single market, which they will not be shaping. But there is trade lawyers must be white to say, where have we been? The WTO is the more access you give to your market, the better off you are, the better off they are. It's a win-win situation. There's no counterfactual. So what's this about? Shouldn't the starting point of the negotiation be a kind of political most favored nation deal? We start off before we even negotiate. Any access to the single market that we give any third country, of course we will give Britain. We start negotiating beyond that point. You've already satisfied 60 or 70 percent of what Britain wants and needs. And free movement of workers is not on the table because you give all these benefits to everybody else. Take in now the bilateral investment treaties that every member states of the European Union has with hundreds of countries around the world. The number of bilateral trade investment is in the thousands and the heaviest users of them are the Europeans, not the Americans. Two thirds of bilateral investment disputes are European companies. There's a lot of European hypocrisy there. As long as we get to use it in our investment relations with, you know, out there, it's good. But in TTIP, oh, this is against democracy. The very same instrument that you are using every day of the week. It's okay when it's for the Chinese, but it's not okay when it's in our backyard. But let's put that aside. If we take the aggregate of the bilateral investment treaties that the member states of the European Union have, half the issue of passporting has gone away. Because as part of bilateral investment treaties, you have to allow directors, etc., to come in. I say half, not the delicate half. So if, again, if you said as your starting point, and obviously we would give the United Kingdom every benefit we give to any country in which any member state of the European Union has a bilateral investment treaty, if it's good to do it with Venezuela, why would it not be good to do it with the United Kingdom? Why spend months and enrich lawyers negotiating an key which is already there. So I come to the second point. We have to give them a tough deal because otherwise it will be tempting. Europe is sick. And to cure itself, it needs some strong medicine. You're not going to get the medicine it needs if you have seven Eurosceptic governments as part of the 27 members of the European Union. It's just not going to happen. So you want to give Britain the best deal that they can get because it's in your interest to do it, because it's your neighbors, because you're cutting your nose to spite your face if you don't. But you also want it to be a moment of truth after 60 years of European integration where the deal is on the table. You don't like to be part of this community of faith. You just want to have economic relations with our single market. Here's a very comfortable deal. Bon voyage. We like you. It's your choice. But if you're in, you understand that we have to do some serious restructuring of how we govern. Otherwise, we will disintegrate that everybody is worth off, or we will continue from crisis to crisis. My political expectation is that most of the peoples of Europe will vote to stay in. I'm sure practically all the parliaments will, because I don't like these referenda. Not because I don't trust the people, because I don't like the way referenda reduce complex issues into a, a thing. But even if it were referenda, and I don't lament the loss if some countries move into associate membership, a la UK. Because it's a renewal of vows for those who remain in. 
and since I'm a Democrat, to have a European integration based on fear of leaving rather than the wish to be inside just because it's going to be so awful outside so you better not, that's not a good basis for what Europe needs for itself. So that's why I find so dismal the current, discor the current post-Brexit discourse. I think I've talked more than enough and I'll stop here. Thank you.